Right. We're on. Are we rolling? We are, yep, we're on. Welcome to the Dave and Ed podcast episode number five. five. Cinco in Spanish, Sank in French, and Fouf in German. That's right. Uh, Who we got this week, Ed? We got David Cote. David Cote. What famous, does David Cote do? A very famous New York journalist, critic. We're very excited to talk to him. Fantastic. Can't wait for David. Yeah, he's going to join us any moment. Any moment. Beautiful day outside. It is indeed. 75 degrees here in New York City. Spring is here. That is correct. The beaches are opening next weekend, Memorial Weekend. Indeed, there. 50% capacity, as per the governor. Oh, yes, only. Uh, the governor, yeah. uh, what's his name? Mr. Cuomo, who the women all love. Cuomo! Yes, indeed. What a guy. Hey! David Cote is here. David. Hello. Hi, David. Hello. Can you hear us? Oh, he has. Uh, can you hear us? Oh, he's connecting to audio. Okay, he's connecting. David Cote. Can't hear us yet. There we go. Oh, there you are. Hello, David. <laughs> Good afternoon, David. Welcome to the David Ed Podcast. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thanks. Of course. How are you doing? How are you doing uh, during all this situation, this thing? This I'm going insane. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yes. Dead body back there. It's a delivery guy. Uh, but I, I'm, glad, I'm glad to still see you're still writing during it because I, I saw your review of Molly Sweeney, which was cool. And, um, you know, it's good that it hasn't affected you that way, right? I guess. Or has it a bit? Everybody. I mean, every theater critic I know, I mean, we all have like we have like little zoom meetings here and there right. uh a uh, cocktail hour with critics and uh <laughs> right yeah you know every, everybody's just you know gutted by the fact that there's no work out there and that that the theater is just um i mean it's not dead it's transforming and it's it's going to hibernation rights but uh nobody knows what the future is i mean like you know broadway of course announced that what september 6th they're going to uh reopen but yes. nobody really Thinks that's going to happen. I think. Right, right. Um, uh, Frozen just closed. Yeah. 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 So I mean, that says something about the thoughts about the future, of course. Why? Um, um, Disney is such a huge multinational corporation, and they're obviously mm -hmm. backing Frozen. Why do you think they closed Frozen? So like that. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, all I can guess is that they that they had already had done projected ticket revenues for the show, and that you right. know was not. You know that maybe they would have had to close it in a year or two anyway, so they're cutting their losses now. Um, right. right. And you know, putting their resources, like everybody is, into developing work for when we get out of this. I suppose. I mean, I'm sure that Disney has, you know, a dozen or two dozen projects, uh, theater projects in the pipeline. I'm sure. You know. Right. Right. Well, um, before we talk more about uh, theater and your life now, let's go back to 1969. Yes, <laughs> the summer of 69. <laughs> Born and raised in rural New Hampshire. Could you tell us about yes. that early days? You, you were adopted, yep. is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't date me, please. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you look good. amazing, though. Yeah. Well, look at John Simon. Well, he, you know, John Simon's like misty. Is he still alive, John Simon? Yeah. No, he's dead. He's quite oh. dead. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, guess, I mean, he's only he's only recently dead, and and right. thank you for bringing him up right away. So quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those of you who the yeah, legendarily sorry, racist and misogynistic theater critic John Simon. <laughs> exactly. Well, there you go. Um, I mean, I can only aspire, right? I can only. Uh, <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, no, he's uh, no, he's a he's a fascinating. He was a fascinating case in the pathology of the theater critic. Uh, yes. Wow. Uh, you know, somebody who sort of. I mean, it's amazing he lived so long and. Uh, and for what though? For what? Uh, <laughs> you know, do you know uh, the Conor McPherson uh, monologue, Saint Nicholas? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. About a theater critic who falls in with a group of vampires. Uh, yes. Yeah. Originally performed by Brian Cox, I think uh, here uh, here in New York at least. Yeah. That's right. That's correct. You know the famous story about Cox seeing two of his uh, lovers in the audience on one night, and he yeah. forgot his lines. He looked stage left, and there was a ex-girlfriend or might made an ex-wife and looked the opposite side and was an extra so he dried and he had to start again famous story yes oh we, we digress but yeah so so um 
Forget about the date, 1969. Just tell us about the early days. In Iraq. Yeah, tell us about New Hampshire back in the day. Back in the day. Oh, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was like, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll all over that. Um, <laughs> New Hampshire, New Hampshire. <laughs> yeah, New Hampshire. You know, I mean, I had, you know, I'll be honest. I, I, I really fucking despise New Hampshire a lot, what? you know. Awesome. But, uh, yeah. You know, I, I mean, it's provincial. Like, I don't know where you guys are from in, in Ireland, but it's, yep. uh, you know. Small towns. Yeah. yeah. Small towns, yeah. Which you kind of love until you're like eight or nine, and then you fucking hate. Uh, <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> and then, you, and then you, then you move to a city, and like six months later, you're like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a nice little cabin in the woods somewhere, you know? Uh, right. So, no, I mean, I, I grew up. Uh, yeah, in a small town, the town of, um, I like to say the town of uh, Peyton Place. Peyton Place in the 50s was a best-selling yep. yeah, novel about uh, the steamy passions under, underneath the, the placid exterior of a New England town. And, uh, you know, it was written by a woman named Grace Metallius, who, like my parents, were uh, uh, French-Canadian. Wow. So she, and, uh, and you know, uh, she had this huge hit in the 1950 or something called Peyton Place. And she wrote it while she was living in Gilmanton, the small town I grew up in, um, but also the town many years before that in the late 1800s was home to a guy named Herman Mudgett, who, was, uh, who grew up to become H.H. H. Holmes, who uh, was the subject of Devil in the White City. Um, so he grew up to be basically, he grew up to be a serial killer. Uh, he grew up to be, uh, he was in Chicago around the World's Fair and he devised some house of horrors where he lured people in and tortured them to death. So I like to think that my hometown is like sort of the birthplace of a serial killer and a sex scandal. Uh, so um, just, I don't know, I'll write about it someday. Gilmanton, New Hampshire, population 2000. Uh, I grew up walking in the woods, you know, eating herbs or eating shit off the ground and, you know, being a kid and um, not, not shit. I didn't, eat, I didn't eat shit. I eat shit now as a theater critic. But uh, no, uh, <laughs> I, I ate like uh, purple clover and... Um, Wood sorrel. Okay. Cool. Healthy. Um, yeah. Psychedelic stuff. No, no. I mean, you know, now now that I'm I've been shut down, I'm like, I wish I had a pot connection because I don't even like pot, but I'm just like anything, you know. Right. right. I mean, so I mean, I think we're all sort of like, yeah, uh, drugs. Definitely, I would like some drugs. Do you know? Do you know anybody who has drugs? We don't actually. Have, oh yeah, we're in yeah. the Irish boys. Yeah. We're clean yeah. and sober. Yeah. We are full. Okay. Right? Yeah. Good. 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 Um, so, like, were you the smartest kid in school? How was school and all that stuff? When did I had a group. Play? Yeah, uh, I was in no, I was in high school, like uh, in the, the mid '80s, yes. and uh, I was in a group. I, you know, I, yeah, I loved theater. I loved writing English. I loved uh, writing. I mean, English lit. I loved um, journalism. You know, high school journalism, doing that. So, but I mean, I was, I was, I, I fell in with a group of kids who were into the similar stuff. So right. we were. We had that sort of band. You know. uh, who, did, who did you play in West Side Story? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to regret that Wikipedia page for the rest of my life. Uh, <laughs> did you create uh, Wikipedia page? No, no. <laughs> no. What do you think of me? A friend did. Uh, uh, shit. Uh, oh, a character named Gladhand. Yes. Right, of course. Yeah. You know it. I don't know. Uh, I, uh, did you see the revival by any chance? Didn't get to see it. I just know because I played Officer Krupke when I was in Ireland once, yeah, oh, wow. years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also, so like, were you a, you can be honest with us, were you a good actor? Uh, well, I believe you were because we're going to get to that later when you moved to New York and you worked with some yeah. big people. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed it. It was my way of, uh, what can I say? Being a, a, a repressed uh, Catholic, Mm -hmm. adopted kid from the middle of nowhere you know with uh, with bonding issues i uh, i you know i i, I love theater i love I, I so it was i think there was a tremendous like any actor I, I hope has a tremendous fire and you know there's a kind of place of it's either a place of love or a place of anger or a place of messianic zeal to yeah. like get up there on the stage and like tell people what to think uh so, or right. what not to think or, i don't know what so yeah i was driven so it, it was something you wanted to pursue professionally, like you wanted to. to yeah, do. yeah. I mean, it was sort of way. It was it was a way of expressing myself and getting over my shyness and whatever. Yeah. So you know, I went to then I went to Bard College and studied acting because 
Yeah. But you know, it's like, like sex drives everything. So basically I sort of realized that if I were in the theater department at Bard, I might actually have sex. Right. And uh, so that was sort of the right. driving thing there. Just to jump back real quickly, did you go to uh, a public school or a private school? Public school. Public school, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, you studied dance as well, is that right? Sort of, yeah. I mean, I was put into some dance pieces in college, but only because I couldn't dance really, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're mostly com comical pieces. Right. So, so talk to us about Bar College. Talk to us more about that, about like your your time there and what you got up to and what and what you studied. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, <coughs> you know, it's like I, I you know, high school was 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 a wonderful. Well, it was a difficult time, and you know, I got to do theater and and like I said, the school newspaper, and I uh, I, I got a scholarship to Bar, which is great. And so I, you know, I guess I thought I was you know hot shit or whatever, but. Uh, you know, despite being a provincial kid and full of all the insecurities that 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 come with that, but you know, I went to Bard. What was interesting about Bard was that initially it was just being smacked upside the head because everybody I met was smarter, funnier, more well, more well traveled, more cultured than I was, and so I suddenly felt like an extremely like um, yeah provincial conservative almost person when I was at college. Uh, but you know, it was so it was a kind of a it was a rude awakening, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But Bard is in the middle of, no, not in the middle of nowhere. It's in the Hudson River Valley, beautiful area. Um, so it was kind of a nice transition for me. It, it was a nice transition from coming from nowhere mm -hmm. on my way to the city, I guess, eventually. But Bard was great. It was like a lot of freedom. It was a liberal arts school in the late 80s. I went from 88 to 92. So it was an interesting period of like the first wave of, well, it depends on how you date it. I was going to say the first wave of like serious PC culture. So, uh, oh. which of course you could say, started in the 60s, really. But, you know, so in the late 80s and the 90s, people were getting much more political. And I studied Shakespeare. I tried to study Shakespeare through a sort of more political lens. So that was an interesting mental exercise for me. Um, but mainly, I, mainly I, so I, for a while, I, I'm, I'm babbling, but for a while I was trying to do a double major of English lit and theater. And I ended up just getting sucked into theater because that just takes, up, takes over your life. Oh. Doing doing plays, right. but um, for a while I wanted to write about Shakespeare's um, Richard II, Henry IV, parts one and two, and Henry V, uh, the Henriad, because um, I was fascinated by the Hal, Fal, the Fal, Hal Falstaff relationship, um, and uh, and you know power power dynamics and uh, social dynamics in Shakespeare's time. There's a there's a school of of uh, criticism called uh, New Historicism, which is kind of uh, started in the 80s. Uh, a professor named Stephen Greenblatt was kind of one of the more prominent writers and he published a biography of Shakespeare about 10 years ago called Will in the World, yeah. which is really quite excellent. Yeah. 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 Anyway, but yeah, theater, but theater took up all my time because it was fun, it was social, it was really um, more fulfilling in many ways. Right. Can you talk to us about the Hal Falstaff relationship a little bit? I, oh God. I, <laughs> get ready for T TMI, uh, time. <laughs> I, no, look, I mean, as a, oh, Jesus, I'm not even drinking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, adoption, for, for better or worse, has been a very sort of um, important thing in my life. Yeah. I, it's, I don't know, for many people, it's like, what, you know, if you were adopted as an infant, what, what, what does it matter? You were raised by these people. And yet, I think that that in certain, I mean, even the best adopted situation, there's a, there's sort of there's a slippage or a gap in terms of like how much you feel a part of this family or person. And if you're if you're raised by sort of awkward or emotionally stunted people, I think you're going to end up being um, having profound a profound sense of disconnect. You're going to be. I think you're going to gravitate towards surrogate figures. I think you're going to see. Most relationships is kind of art family relationships as artificial. You're going to see um, performance as a kind of substitute for a real feeling. Mm -hmm. And anyone can have these feelings, of course. Of course, anybody can. But I think for me as an adoptee, that those things were exaggerated. So I think, and also, I, mean, I grew up with a father who was sort of uh, vivacious and fun-loving, but was deeply self-destructive and alcoholic. And so I think in Falstaff, I saw a kind of, 
father figure to Hal that was not blood relation, but was sort of a, a teacher, a tutor, and uh, but also a leech. Uh, I think, and then My Own Private Idaho came out actually. You know that movie that Gus Van Sant was Classic. Yeah. River Phoenix. I was, uh, River Phoenix and um, with, with, with sections from, from Henry IV uh, part two or one in there. Yeah, it's a, that came out when I was trying to like when I was laboring mightily over my dissertation or my senior project, and failing. And I, that movie came out, and I was like, "Fuck!" He said everything I wanted to say about how also portraying Hal as a male hustler was very interesting because I've always thought that if I if I ever directed Henry the Fourth Parts One and Two, I would not have him be a male hustler necessarily, but I would have Hal Hal be struggling with addiction through both parts, uh -huh. uh, because. The two plays in part one gets done more than part two. And part two can sometimes seem like um, just going over the same territory as before as we wait for Henry IV to die, for Hal to get the crown, for him to reject Falstaff in that fantastic rejection scene. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, so anybody who has problems with their father, I think, will find the Hal Falstaff relationship <laughs> and the rejection. Like, I know thee not, old man, fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs become a fool and jester. You know, and he's like, fuck you, <laughs> go, go into the grave, you fuck. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so I think Hal is a junkie. Uh -huh. And so he's fighting it. And he, I mean, he kicks it by the end. Right. So, so you left Bard and then like, if I'm correct, you moved to New York City and you kind of got immersed in the off off Broadway scene. Is that right? Fair to say? Yeah. I mean, actually I, I got, I fell in with another, with a Falstaff. Uh, this uh, teacher of mine from Bard, Iranian exile, oh, yes. who is a right, uh, Ashur Banipal Babila, yeah. who was this sort of Buddha ish. Class. <laughs> What's that? Say that three times faster. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it took me a while. <laughs> yeah, he, he, uh, he went by Bani, like Danny with a B. Uh, so Ashur Banipal Babila. He was like uh, the Persian Charles Ludlam, I guess is what I say to people like he, oh. or uh, trying to think like, what's a figure of. Uh, yeah, but Charles Ludlum and his, his, theater, his theater was also like scatological, blasphemous, nice. and just carnivalesque. Hence and the exile. What's that? Hence the exile. Hence the exile from. Iran. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah. then when he was in Iran in, in 1979 as a, as a gay Presbyterian uh, avant garde artist, wow. not, not too popular. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sure. Uh, so, so he. You, uh, you guys started doing a bunch of stuff together? like shows Yeah, he had, a, he had a company called Purgatorio Inc. Theater. Right. And um, yeah, so he so I saw one of his, his, he did a solo show in the city. I came to see it after I moved here. And he said, we're looking for an actor, so join us. And yeah, and so I started doing work with him. And he was also kind of this rotund, you know, man of great appetites who, uh, yeah, in some ways, like my father, Falstaff, my father, and Ashur Banipal are in some way the same kind of like life devouring, larger than life, kind of like this fat, a fat destroyer of worlds. I mean, you know, or some, some of them are, have creative energies and some of them have destructive energies, you know? Sure. Um, yeah, and that's what I'm becoming in my, in my life right now, of course, a fat, destructive person, so, you know. Hey. <laughs> uh, no, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> How is the stuff received, um, that, that his, his plays? And you know, it's some, some got some nice and good reviews. Um, you know, they did, they put on shows at like The Kitchen, La Mama, PSM 22. Right. Um, yeah, La Mama a couple times. Um, you know, I mean, some of the shows were, got really well reviewed. Uh, we did a show where the, uh, what were they called? God, the, it was called the Bowery Lane Theater. The, which company was there? The, uh, oh, the Jean Cocteau rep. Were, uh, it was on uh, Bow the Bowery. Um, we did a show there that was very much Edward, Edgar Allan Poe inspired called Homo Americanos. And it was a big gothic, crazy gay camp spectacle. Mm -hmm. And the reviews were sort of mixed. I don't know, I mean, he, his work was not quite outsider as far as, you know, what's outsider in off-off Broadway theater. But I mean, he never became really established. But you know, we had a company, we got grants from NISCA, we, 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 were, we had a, we were, had off-off, Sorry, nonprofit status. So it was a functioning company that had, that employed actors and did shows. And I worked with him basically from '92 to like '98. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so describe New York City back then. Yeah, the 80s. Yeah. What was your life? Yeah. Uh, you know, trying to scrape together rent. Uh, How much rent? How much I don't rent? know. I, I paid like, I, I, to live in half of a, of a living room, I paid $110 in, uh, you know, 92. Yeah, right. I, you know, I paid like three or four hundred dollars for a while, six hundred dollars. You know, it would go up. I lived on the Bowery with uh, some actors who had been there for ages. I paid like five hundred bucks for a big room. You know, rent was, yeah. Generally, I tried to keep it under a thousand. Right. And then, yeah. And then even by like two thousand, I moved to a studio in Queens, and I paid like seven hundred and fifty bucks for a studio. So, yeah. Right. Uh, you know, and it was. It was Working and trying to pay the rent, trying to pay the bills and all that stuff. Sure. Right. And sure. At what point did you embrace the internet? Oh, yeah. Good question. Hmm. Well, like everybody, I started, I, um, I got email in the 90s or whatever, I guess. And Were you still in college when you had email or was it after college? It was after college. I graduated in 92. So I think it was like 95, 96 email started up. Yeah. Something like that. You know, it's funny because ni from 96 to 98, I, I co-founded um, a zine, uh, you know, that's so 90s, uh, a zine for off-off-Broadway theater called Off, Journal of Alternative Theater. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that was like, we didn't like have a real website or anything like that. It was just kind of like, it was actual paper that we left at actual theaters for free. So yeah, that was, that was not embracing the internet, of course, obviously. Right. Before we get into... Uh your life as a critic. I just want to know what was it like working with uh, Richard Foreman as an actor? It, yeah, it was... Because um, you played a giant dwarf, is that correct, in one of his productions? Uh, the characters are called large male dwarfs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there were four of us. Uh, actually, I wish I had a picture. I don't, I don't have a handy picture. But we, 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 there were four of us, and we were basically chorus members who like, sort of lurked around the periphery of the, um, of the stage. In these like conical turd shaped hats, wow. uh, and uh, with uh, we had we had augmented asses, we had like sort of a uh, padded asses, yeah, and uh, long pieces of lingerie and butcher's aprons. Um, yeah, it was kind of an interesting, nightmarish uh, creatures like little little trolls or you know, gnomes sort of like uh, wandering around, and we'd move tables. And we take string because you know in Foreman he often has string on um, pulleys. So you like take some string and you bring it to like this <laughs> and, you know, you know, you point to it. You bring a mirror out and you're like, you know. <laughs> Did, like, uh, like and I guess the criticism of that kind of stuff is uh, it can take away the actor's humanity. Uh, <laughs> would you agree with that? <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, oh, the technique, you know. The... Well, I mean, does, does mime take away the actor's humanity or does clowning? Uh... Great. I mean, bad mime does. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. And bad clowning would as well. I mean, he, uh, hmm. well, like, we're we, we had like, I forget how many weeks of rehearsal. We had like more than like four weeks. We had like eight weeks or nine weeks of rehearsal. Uh -huh. So he gets, lot, he gets lots of rehearsal time. And it's fucking hard because basically you're, you're, you're spending five or six or whatever hours a day. Uh, with him in the audience, uh, with a sound person like playing loops, you know, like playing um, music on loops, yeah. you know, um, and maybe some lights and some set elements there because he, he wants to work with as many elements as possible. And he'll be like, okay, so uh, for this section, uh, the dwarves come out and they're carrying, um, they're carrying like uh, this sort of, you know, I don't know, let's say, uh, I'm just making this up, but like, like uh, coffee, coffee urns. Like they, they bring out these coffee urns, and um, you come out from those doors. You come out from those doors, and we play this loop here. And they, they they come center stage, and they go in a circle, and then we hear this ping, and then they all fall down, and then they get up and they in a really high pitched voice scream, and then run off. You know, <laughs> and he'll rehearse that for like twenty minutes, and you're wow. doing it, and then after a while he'll be like, "No, we're not gonna do that." Uh, so. <laughs> He just, he was like a painter and he was just like painting the stage sure. with all these like sound, mm -hmm. image, movement. Right. Well, I guess, yeah. I guess, I guess the actor can find his own or her own uh, creative way of making that work for them through that direction. I mean, was he, he was, was he like anal about it? Like, was he, you're not doing it right kind of thing? Or was it, did he have every little specific gesture have to be spot on or? 
Did you have room to play is what I'm asking. I think there's room to play. I mean, on the one, first of all, I think, you know, working with him in rehearsal then in performances, you definitely had to sort of go on a head trip. For the, and, and there were many shows and we toured it around to Rome, Fran, uh, Paris, Mm -hmm. to went to the went to the went to the west coast here and uh other places and we, we ended up with like a, a month run in in uh down in tribeca uh to the tribeca performing arts center <clears throat> which was difficult because audiences were used to seeing his shows at the ontological so getting audience filling the house downtown in a more off-broadway space was was difficult but um I found that I just sort of, you just go into a trip. You're like, I'm in the show. And it's so it's such a sensory experience because the music is going and the sound effects are going and this weird cryptic language he writes. It's like you're having a, it's like you're having a trip, right. but you know exactly what you're doing. So it's just, it's, it's just as fulfilling as, I guess, delivering a great speech from Shakespeare or O'Neill or something. Okay. But it's just, uh, it's just, you know, it's just, everything is, it's mysterious. and it's the meaning of it is completely completely up for grabs okay. you know if you accept that they're like there there is no real meaning here except for what you want to project onto it that's you know yeah. kind of liberating i guess yeah. so as an actor you were fulfilled yeah i mean okay look i'll be honest we okay. had the non-speaking roles so after like a few after you know taking it on the road for a while you're like i wish i had a fucking line in this thing you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. sure yeah sure uh, but uh, I will say that, uh, um, oh, I don't know. I mean, oh, okay, there was, a, when we were, in, we were in Hartford, Connecticut, doing it for like four or five weeks. And he left, we opened it, he left, he came back. And there was, there was after one performance, he did have to come backstage and talk to the dwarves. You know, he's a director and he was not, uh, and he wouldn't pussyfoot around and he basically had to correct us in the sense that in his absence, we had gotten a bit uh, goofy and sure. a bit, uh, you know, so he had to say, like, you know, you need to pull it back. It looks like a Polish, you know, looks like a Polish avant-garde cloud show out there. You know? <laughs> What's wrong with that? I don't know. Okay. What, do you have against, what do you have against Krakowski, for God's sake? <laughs> uh, so we were all like, okay, sorry, sorry, Richard. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll deadpan it up a bit more, you know? Yeah, deadpan it up. I like that. Yeah. So um, in 2000, you joined Time Out New York. How did that come about? And, like... Obviously, you were writing, like you mentioned, for Off, and uh, mm -hmm. so there was always you were always writing like criticism, critical reviews while performing, and so that was like a is that true or not? Were you writing? No, because I it was I was mostly acting as an editor and right. you know occasionally writing like something some manifesto ish rant about this or that, but right. I was not like go I was not going in there uh, and mm -hmm. actually saying let me tell you about this Irish rep production I just saw. Right. Um, it, it was. Uh, I was, you know, and I was sort of at some of those publications that I was that I put together. We we did run reviews, but I never I never really had a, a desire to do that. Uh -huh. So, but I mean, because I had done those publications uh, off off Broadway, press agents like Ron Lasco and others knew knew who I was and knew that I was sort of part. I was I was I was part of the scene, but I was also trying to like write about it because I loved writing about theater. Yeah. Because I mean, the only constant, the only constants in my life have been like writing and making or being in theater, and that's you know been great. I've been lucky. Um, so anyway, so Jason Zinneman, who was the theater editor at Time Out, was looking for a staff writer to be a critic and and write news stories as well. Mm -hmm. So he he needed somebody who knew specifically the downtown scene, and so people like Ron Lasco recommended me, and that's how I I, I gave him some writing clips, and he interviewed me, and I got the job. And I, I, but I, I was very aware at the time that I was like, oh shit, I'm gonna have to write some reviews now. And I've never actually written a formal review. Oh, right. wow, wow. Yeah, and um, so when you were working at Time Out, um, who, what company owned uh, Time Out? Were they owned by a bigger umbrella company, media company, or were they independent? No, at that time they were owned by Tony, well, I don't know, entire, Tony Elliott, who started it and started Time Out in 68. In um, in London. Okay, cool. As far as I know, I don't know if there might have been other. He was the principal stakeholder owner, I think. There might have been some American investors and and all that as well. Right. So were you like so you hadn't written reviews? Were you like trepidatious about um, criticizing? Yeah. People? yeah, I thought I thought you know 
step over to the dark side, man. It's like, you know, right. <laughs> it's like people are going to like dislike you or, mm -hmm. you know, you, uh, yeah. And then I went out, I went to the strand and I bought like a couple of collections of reviews by Kenneth Tynan, yes. who was the British, you know, theater sure. critic. <clears throat> sure. So he would have been an influence or, um, yeah. Like... I mean, I was like, I was like, what's a good review look like? Cause I sort of had, right. I'd grown up reading them. Um, I would read fine gold and the voice of course. And, uh, you know, I read the time reviews in the Times all the time. Uh, so those are my principal areas. And then, you know, and you, we all had cultivated ideas of what a theater critic is like or supposed to be. You know, what the, you know, we sort of exaggerated ideas of like tone. Like, am I supposed right. to be arch? Am I supposed to be funny? Am I supposed to be witty and bitchy? Am I supposed to be like, you know, uh, old-fashioned sounding? I mean, I I didn't really know what voice I needed to have for this uh, activity. Uh, and were, were, were Time Out New York kind of putting pressure on you to uh, have a certain type of voice with the reviews? Or? No, I'll be perfectly honest now that, you know, since I've had, I'm not there anymore. At the time, you know, because you would read Feingold's reviews, you know, I have a different attitude towards Feingold now, but at, time, at the time, Feingold's reviews like seemed so goddamn erudite. Wow, mm -hmm. he's one classy motherfucker. Uh, and uh, he, he's read a lot of things and he knows what he's talking about. And he's so, he's so, um, so intellectual. Um, and Time Out, however, seemed like, you know, didn't seem, it seemed kind of dumbed down. You know, I was a bit of a snob and I didn't know anything. So that's what I, the thoughts that were going through my head. And I thought, well, I can maybe class things up at Time Out because I'm a smarty. Um, which is, which bullshit. I mean, all I could do was bring my passion and what I knew about some companies that needed more attention. Like there's a company called Radio Hole uh, that was in the, in the late 90s to the 2000s. That was, a, they're still around. Um, there were like companies like that. And I thought elevator repair service could get more time. I wanted to, the companies that I knew and loved from downtown theater, I wanted to give them more attention. Right. Mm -hmm. um, even Richard Foreman, I thought, you know, could get more attention sure. and time out. So I, I was trying to bring my, the people that I liked into the fold more. Um, right. But no, I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't know. I guess I'm talking out of the sides of my mouth, but it's like, on the one hand, I kind of wanted to, I did, I did want to, I did want to like sort of elevate the tone at tough time out reviews yeah but how to do how to do that is not by being snobby or you know throwing in like the village voice for example you know yes in the, in the 90s you'd read a review and they'd be like in a Foucauldian sense or you know in, in terms of Lacanian uh, psychoanalytics this you know they would always throw in some goddamn fucking you know yeah. as Heidegger said uh da -da -da. <laughs> yeah. of course and I I cannot I couldn't pull it off because I haven't read any of those assholes so um uh I very honest I can only yeah, I, I can only be, you can only be funny, you can just be funny, you can just be passionate and try to be a good, try to analyze things in an intelligent way. That's all uh, you can do. So, yeah, so time out. So, so in your early days, were you like writing a lot of like favorable reviews to kind of bring more attention to these people that you speak of, like forming? Or... I mean, I was, no, I mean, if I saw their work and I liked it, I'd try to be enthusiastic. I mean, I couldn't. I tried not to review like close friends work, you know? Yeah, right. Right. But if you saw something that was just fucking great, like um, National Theater of the United States of America, which is a company from two, uh, like 2000, 2001 to like 2000. Well, I guess they might still be around, but they, they have like a five or six or seven year run that was just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I knew Yehuda Duenas, who was a co-founder of the company and a guy named Ryan Bronze. Uh, they were both, um, involved with the, the Foreman production that I was in called it was called Pearls for Pigs the play the Foreman play I was in and so I went down to see the Yehuda's show which was called like Garvey and Super Pants and it was like a sort of crazy high octane clown show it was kind of like influenced by Foreman and the Worcester group to some extent mm -hmm. but it was like also very slapsticky and retro and they built like this giant this giant like this tiny jewel box theater in Times Square and then it was just kind of this, it's like this manic vaudeville show. Right. Um, if you, yeah, look them up, NTUSA. They're just an amazing company. Um, so I, I saw that and I was like, fuck, this is great. I need to write about this. So it was like that. So but I tried to avoid conflict of interest to answer your question. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. But in terms of positive reviews, I mean, I don't know, man. I, one of the earliest reviews I did was an Irish rep thing. Uh, oh, yeah. It was a um, production of... Um, there's a reading of uh, Don Juan in Hell. Oh. And had a really amazing cast. And I'm, you know, I, but if I went back and looked at that review, I'd probably be a little, have a bit of attitude there, you know. 
but uh, right. yeah, we have to go back and look at that review. Yeah. No, yeah. no, you'll never find it because the, <laughs> the um, internet has swallowed it up. Did you have any rivals at that time? Oh yeah, yeah. Like in the the critic sphere. Yeah. Did you have people that you bumped into at at, at shows and was like, oh, you again? <laughs> <laughs> it's always like that uh, I don't know you know like in terms of like John Simon oh, here we go you know no no I mean there was a play called uh, Comic Potential that like in 2000 or something 2001 2002 everything's 2000 um, yeah. Comic Potential it was a play by Alan Akborn, Akborn yeah. uh, that empty the Manhattan Theatre Club did uh, and you know I've seen lots of uh, have you seen, seen Aikborn stuff over the years, right? Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, it's funny. It's well crafted. It's you know, it's it's of its time, I guess. This was a play in which the wonderful actress Janie D uh, played a, a, a an android, a, a, an android woman, and the 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 young uh, hero of the story falls in love with her, and they go on the lam to find true love somewhere. I don't know what. It's about a guy who falls in love with an android woman, and John Simon wrote this fucking review for New York Magazine that was like, oh. You know, he's this old cr creepy Serbian. Uh, he was, and he was just like, if you, if you see, if you see only one play this uh, this season, make it comic potential. It's uh, it's the heights of comic uh, invention. It's a dizzyingly funny, blah blah blah. I don't know. I'm just he like he like he creamed all over this 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 sure. somewhat me this somewhat mediocre Alan Akeborn play, and I gave it a mixed review. And I wrote a letter to New York Magazine that was just like. I like it better when John Simon's on his meds, you know, when he's here. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and it's like, it's, you know, the guy, the guy was a complete creep as far as women goes. I mean, like, the, the, the purpose of actresses in plays was to give him an erection, I guess. Like, right. basically, yeah, right. they, they were doing it up there. So the idea of having an attractive woman playing an android, that's like Nirvana, you know, <laughs> basically. So I just basically wrote a letter to the, and they ran it. They ran it in New York Magazine, basically saying, you know, but you know, it, it, so that was kind of a bitchy thing we do. It's so like this guy overpraised this rather banal piece of theater, but I had to because you know, but you know that was that was just that was one thing I did. That was just I don't know. I yeah, uh, but John, John Simon reminded me of the um, as the Henry Kissinger of theater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like, you know, like casting directors have often said, um, we make up our minds within 10 seconds. Like, so when you're reviewing a play, like, is there a feeling after a couple of minutes, oh, can you step back and be, can a critic really be objective, I guess? Are, are they immediately going, oh, fuck it, I hate this after two minutes, or, or I love this. Are, are they being impressionable, or are they really being like, is my question making sense? Can you really step yeah. back and go, uh, or do you have instinctual reactions that, like, any human would? Well, we are human. Yes. Of, you know, yeah. Oh, I agree. Like, uh, like <laughs> just, yeah. to be, just to, if we may, like, me and Dave love critics. We laugh at the good and the bad. We yeah. love, yeah. We love it. We, I, I've been criticized and praised, so yeah. we think everybody should be zen about critics. But well, yeah, yeah. I um, mean, as an actor, I don't really care what the critics say, really. Good. I think it's all good. It's all yeah. good. It's all okay. But I guess, yeah, but I guess, like, my question is, like, I mean... Uh, I mean, I do value the critics, of course. Yes. Yeah, the intelligent. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> can, can we be really pretentious for a moment? Of course, yeah, yeah. on this month in 1891, Mr. Wilder, countryman, um, released critic as artist, as masterpiece. Yes. Um, so do you consider yourself an artist? I've just answered, asked you four questions now or something. Um, are you an artist as a critic, David? I think that's I think it's fucking fascinating, and I, I um, excuse my language. I don't know why. I guess I'm just you know enjoy enjoy swearing. Fuck it. Um, yeah, we like it. it. <laughs> <laughs> We're a really yeah. edgy podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so interesting. You know, I I taught uh, at Brooklyn College for two semesters. I taught great college. Uh, yeah, I taught um, in in the in the English department. Actually, I, I taught like a seminar about criticism like you know and it was um uh yeah arts criticism basically and it was so we we touched on theater criticism but also film and dance and whatever and the i won't go on about it but basically it was like the part of it was uh, uh the history of you know so we read some like some uh, major essays and 
in, in, in criticism or about criticism. And then we just, there was a lot of talking about the impulse, the critical impulse, like why do it? You know, you know not, not just the level of published criticism, but the sort of the, the human impulse to criticize and to be, to influence, to shape, to, to, to have an effect on reality. The, philosoph the philosophy of criticism, like where does it come from? Um, and is it is it uh, antithetical to art or creation, or is it is it um, is it a creative impulse in, unto itself? And then, of course, there was a part of it was just a writing workshop to help people like form form their thoughts better in writing and more persuasively. Right. So, the critic as artist was part of the syllabus, right. and of course, it's long and it's kind of dense and it's you know I would love to hear an audio version of it because yeah. it's in dialogue form, as you know. Uh, right. Yes. Uh, like two two dandies longing about you know sniffing flowers and talking about art. Yeah, and, uh, like Paul Virgin today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you must. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it would make a good dialogue though. Maybe maybe an edited form. But the, the critic is artist. It's fascinating because this, this sort of somewhat perverse Wildean concept that criticism could be. You could argue that it's superior to art and that it's a distillation of art into a into another another form so whereas art takes art takes from the world and distills whatever the artist is getting from the world into a, a work of art criticism is, is an even finer extraction of truth from that piece of art fascinating yeah so criticism it's, but it's, i think it's just i mean but is criticism as pleasurable as art usually not i don't think because even if it's the most beautifully written review in the world how can it be better than a, a beautiful poem or play or something like that right and how do you balance the the logic with the art when you're a critic? The logic? Yeah, like I mean, I feel like there's um, a, I, I feel like you have to be like um, stoic and logical about what you're seeing as well. That's kind of it. Double downs on my question. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Like objectivity and yeah, like the emotion. Right. But yeah. I, I, well, I mean, objectivity is such a hard thing to you know. I mean, everything is is, is subjective, right? It's like you know, right. you're you're. Uh, <sighs> I mean, all I can do is just, but first of all, I mean, no, I don't make a, I don't make a flip decision like five minutes in or whatever, right. even if it, even if it starts off and it's dreadful. I'm trying to think of an example of, I feel like beginnings are always really hard, you know, for yeah. writers, for actors, like how do you get, how do you get the audience to warm up in the first 10 minutes? I know. Yeah. yeah. I guess, I guess that's why TV talk shows have, have comedians that go out there and warm up the audience, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 So um, I think I feel like um, no, I mean you, you, it's you'll be paying attention from the from the get go, but uh, no, I never make any flip decisions in the first ten minutes. Of course, if it's dreadful and it just keeps being dreadful, well, yeah, then you're you're at some point you are going to make up a make up your mind. But it doesn't mean your mind can't be changed. So I mean, yeah, no, you have to stay open. Like you know, okay, there was a or or, or like what, what what mood are you going into? Like let's say you get you know you. Uh, you, your 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 boyfriend or girlfriend like breaks up with you like five minutes before you go into the show, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gonna affect your mood, right. or, you know, or if it's a, or if it's you know you or you're depressed or you're angry or you're broke or you're just you yeah. know that. Uh, or if you're drunk. I, well, you shouldn't be, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but all, yeah, but also the kind of the pressure of deadlines and stuff like that, yeah. like how that affects the writing, or uh, have you found that affects the quality of your writing? Sometimes, I mean, I, you know, some plays, like I did a, I did a review of The Inheritance, that two-part play that was on Broadway. Yeah. And I mean, I was not a fan. I, in fact, you know, I gave it a pretty negative review, but I had a lot of uh, several days to work on it and to really, you know, go look at the script, to, to sort through my thoughts. And it helped the writing because it was, a, I wanted to write a, you know, it was a, it was a serious piece of work that deserved a serious review, right. even if it was negative. You know. Um, but no, time out, you know, but that also like the pressure of having the first of all, I mean, most critics have usually have about a couple days or three days to write a thing because mm -hmm. you see it on a Tuesday and it opens on a Friday. So you have some time to write the review. Right, right. Yeah. right. Have you ever been written to or approached by uh, an indignant artistic director? <laughs> or actor? Or, yeah. Any, yeah. or producer? Or producer. Yeah. Or anybody involved? Uh, yeah, now and then. Uh, you talk about that? Well, sure. I mean, I don't know. Like, you know, I'll say a positive thing. Like, you know, there, Anne Heche was in a, a yes. play with Alec Baldwin uh, called The 20th Century. Oh, right. and, Yeah, it was like, um, it was not that there was a musical version of it, but it was the, um, God, who was it? Maybe it was um, the guy who wrote the front page, Charles MacArthur, maybe. Yeah. 
it was a comedy from the 20s. I'm sort of getting all my facts wrong. Anyway, it was an, old, an old-fashioned uh, screwball slapstick comedy set on a train with Alec Baldwin and Anne Heche. And she, of course, Anne Heche is a, not, not so, not so uh, prominent anymore as an actress, but, you know, for a while was a little bit of a star. Sure. And she, she was uh, very, very funny, I thought, in the show. And I, 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 my review was a little bit of a love letter. It wasn't a love letter, but it was, a, you know, it was, a, it was like Anne Heche is really funny and she does a great job and she's, she's wonderful. And she wrote me a note, you know, saying thank you. Blah, blah, blah. Because the rest of the production was kind of crappy, but uh, she was great. And so she wrote a note saying thanks. That was nice. Um, but, you know, you never expect notes because that's kind of, it's kind of weird. You're like, don't write to me. Don't write to me. Right. I'm just doing my job. Yeah. But uh, as far as negative stuff goes, uh, I don't know. One time I reviewed a production of an adaptation of Dostoevsky's The Idiot, um, which I think Jim Parsons was in. Uh-huh. Um, but um, Jim Parsons from that sitcom. Yeah, Big Bang Theory. I, yeah, think, right, I think he might have been in it. Right, right. It, uh, again, many, many years ago. And uh, I think I said something sweeping and, and somewhat lazy in the review. Like, I was talking about the actors. And I said, oh, and the rest of the ensemble is sort of mediocre. And then I, ran, I was at a bar. And <laughs> I know, which is like, that's, that's sort of broad, broad, broad bushed. Yeah. And I was at a bar, and I was at the bar getting a drink. And the guy was like, oh, you're a critic. And I'm, he said, yeah, I reviewed, uh, I was in this thing called the, the Idiot. And somehow he knew that I wrote that review. And he said, yeah, you said the ensemble was mediocre. You know, it's in the ensemble. I was like, oh, OK. okay. You know, no, it, was just the, it was just an awkward moment. Nothing really came out of it. You oh, know? Okay. Yeah. He, was, he was like an effeminate actor. Was he? he didn't punch you in the face. <laughs> he was just like, you know, just want to let you know that I was in that ensemble. You know. Brilliant. No, I've never, nobody's, nobody's punched me or, yeah. you know, Good. sent me a, you know, send me a, a, a box of shit or anything like that. No, nothing like that, no. So you were at Time Out New York till 2017 and like, were they all lovely years? You look back fondly at that time? No. Right. no. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the internet ruined everything. Uh, right. in, the, in the sense that, you know, there's, it's, it, it, in the last five or six years being there, it was like, it's, it was harder and harder to just do what you want to do, which is write reviews, you mm-hmm. know? especially when you're not making like tons of money. I mean, the people who are still full-time theater critics in this town, some of them are making really nice livings. You know, some of them are making decent livings. Yeah. But most of us are just, you know, not doing it for the, for the you know, for right. the money. It's, it's not, there's no money. Um, so basically it was, you know, time out. It's like, in, like everywhere else in the media, there's a greater uh, demand for clickbait and for uh, lists and bullshit content to drive traffic. And, you know, it just is no, that's no fun. Yeah. Um, I also feel like uh, there's more of a monopoly now as well. There's less places to go to get your news. Would that be a factor in it too? Like there's a huge consolidation um, in the media? I, well, I guess, I mean, I'm I mean, trying to think like, there are fewer jobs, you know? Right, right. Mm. I mean, the Village Voice doesn't print anymore, so right. we can't pick that up anymore and read it. Or and A lot of these little yeah. magazines that you used to be able to pick up throughout the city are kind of disappeared. Um, I guess there's less yeah. space for the consumer. Mm-hmm. I would say so. I mean, yeah. Mm, yeah, I mean, you still have the major newspapers and magazines. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think who, who, has, who has eliminated theater coverage recently. Well, I would argue that they're also losing money, those big papers and big magazines. They're just being subsidized by a billionaire. Would that be right? Yeah, yeah I would yeah. say so. No, it's... it's yeah. Also, like, you know, nobody knows how to, because everything has to be free and, and easily available online. It's like, you know, I mean, I, I think it's also the fact that, you know, you have, you have consumers who don't want to pay for shit. They, want to, they don't want to pay for content. Yeah. Uh, but then again, I guess the Times has probably done somewhat well for, with, with its, you know, subscri- subscriptions, you know, pay, paywall, right. that kind of thing. Um, no, I mean, advertising just dropped out of the, you know, just dropped in in the in the last 10 15 years and i don't know how to you know i don't know how to right. i don't have any golden solution i don't have any business plan to fix that frankly you know i'm still yeah. just a freelancer where do you see it going are you hopeful i mean i think things are very local right now aren't i mean first of all there's no theater i mean we're we're covering we're covering like yeah zoom thing i mean i'm going to review the the encounter the simon mcburney thing 
Oh yeah. But, uh, yeah. I mean, I reviewed it when it's on Broadway for Time Out, and I'll just I'll review it as a kind of at home audio experience. Um, so I mean, we're, we're we're I don't know. I mean, I would like to think that if there still were a lot of theater going on, that people will maybe when this is over, there'll be a renewed sense of of what's happening in my backyard, what's happening in my community. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, people in terms of like the, in terms of what's happening, because all I can do as a as a theater crit, critic or journalist is write about it. But what pe people who actually are making the, I mean, I, I make the other part of the conversation that we're not having is that I actually actually for the last twelve years I've also been writing yeah. creatively as well. But yes, we but I mean, so I mean, all I can do is respond to like what people are making, and so what they're going to make right now is of course on 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 um, on Zoom or in in digital form. And then if, if, if society starts to reopen, will they just start doing theater in parks or, you know, distanced or mm -hmm. integrated into the community in some ways? Will they be doing stuff like some, an audio tour with, with theatrical elements? You know, will it be experiential? Will it be immersive? Will it be distanced? I don't know. I don't yeah. know what it's going to be. And then as far as the media goes, I'm kind of over, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm really gl glad for the editors who give me work, but I mean, I'm kind of over the media right now because okay. it's, I mean, you know, we can all publish our, I mean, I can just start on my own site. Oh my God. Back to like 2006 and blogs. It's like, you know, right. I, don't know I mean, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to start a blog uh, or a site, but it's like, um, I'm sort of over the idea of media helping me unless there's a, okay. Sorry, I'm babbling. Uh, unless there's a pro public. I mean, the, it's money. It's all about money. So yeah, subsidize, yeah. so subsidize a national or a national chain of local websites that cover the arts impartially, but authoritatively and enthusiastically in your own backyard. Yeah. A ProPublica for the arts that's founded, but funded by the government or private or foundations or private donors. That's that's there to cover the work. You know. Mm -hmm. So that's right. that's the only solution that I have. Is like a fucking billionaire to step up and pay for arts criticism right yes hopefully uh a sane billionaire <laughs> yeah. not an evil insane one because there's a lot of them out there indeed yeah. Uh, yeah. last question before we get to uh what you mentioned about your own creative writing from the last 12 years like regarding the the reviews like were you ever under pressure from a boss to like toe the party line like if you see a play and you don't like it but you're, you have to like it because that's the latest cool thing or anything like that there was never any issues like that no no no, no. i mean the only thing that i would do I, you know i would sometimes you know and this is also goes for the freelancers as well if you see something off off broadway that you know they always have the option to kill a review you see something right. off off broadway that's just not ready for review and you know and a, neg a, a negative review wouldn't really do, do anyone any good you can kill it we, of course you know the creators of the show might disagree they're like we want to have a response i mean i've done work off off Broadway that like got no response, you know, or very little response. So even a negative review can be like illuminating. But um, no, I was never told to like like uh, you know to like what. <laughs> what was the shitty show? Uh, Ghost the musical. Uh, no, nobody, yeah. nobody ever told me that. Good, good, good. So yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about your uh, your life as a playwright and the uh, writing for opera as a libretti. As a libretti. Libretti. Yes. yes. Librettist. Are we pronouncing that pretty yeah. good? Yeah. No, libretto, libretto, librettist. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you write operas in um, in Italian? Oh no, English. Okay. Cool. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean well, American yeah. opera. I mean, I mean, you know, opera is not in. You know, it's not bounded by any kind of national language. Right? Okay. I mean, yeah. you know, you know, uh, English opera. You know, has been around. Um, sure. Since the 1600s. You know, Henry Purcell, the Dido and Aeneas. Um, Right. And, uh, you know, you know, Enda Walsh, you know him? We do. Enda Walsh. Of course we know Enda, yeah. We're aware of him. Yeah. We're well aware of Enda. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. Bad lucky, bad lucky bastard. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. he, uh, he's written libretti for, uh, for a couple of pieces, you know, new pieces, of course. Um, the, guy yeah, from no, Blur, the guy from Blur has written, Damon Albert has written, really? I believe. Opera yes, so it's Kanye. Kanye's written an opera. Kanye, Kanye yeah. yeah. Kanye. 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 Opera for the people. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see the definition of opera is extremely elastic. Right. right. <laughs> yes. So yeah, uh, well, the question. Yeah. So your life. You started writing. When did you start writing operas? Uh, 2008. So um, basically. Produced as well. 
yeah, I've had some, some done. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting art. It's an, it's a collaborative art. I mean, like, like all theater is, but you know, it's intense, you know, obviously it's like, it's more like writing a musical than writing a play. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I just sort of, uh, I saw, I saw an opera in 2006 or seven, excuse me, at uh, Montclair State University, mm-hmm. put on a show. I, it's an opera by David Lang called uh, The Difficulty of Crossing a Field. It had a libretto by Mac Wellman, the yeah. playwright, uh, yeah. experimental playwright. And uh, <clears throat> I just thought it was fascinating, gothic, weird piece of theater that was like, you know, weird language and minimalist music. And it was just, it was like, wow, this is cool. I want to do this. Plus, I, want, I, I had aspirations to go back into theater go back in the theater. I was an actor, right? An actor, I became a critic. And then after eight years of being a critic, I was like, I want to do something, want to make stuff, you know? So, uh, I, but, uh, but not as an actor anymore, but as a writer. So I thought writing a libretto for an opera would be like writing a play with training wheels. I thought it would be a good way to sort of get into it without right. falling on my face, you know? Right. So yeah. And also I just love, I love musicals. I love music theater. I just wanted to explore that. Um, yeah, so I basically, a friend of mine went to, went to Bard with me, was a composer, I, I badgered him, eventually we, we got a commission for something in London, actually, in 2008, and uh, so we wrote, we wrote a 30-minute opera together. Right. Yeah. What was your favorite musical over the last decade? Uh, uh, We've seen. 2010 to present, uh, well, Hamilton's pretty good, uh, yeah, Hamilton's all right, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, you know, the band's visit was beautiful. Um, I think, oh God, I don't, what else? Throw, throw, some name, throw some names out there. What about you guys? What are some favorites of yours? I love If Then with Edina Menzel. <laughs> really? What did you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Like, okay. Uh, <laughs> The Book of Mormons for sure. But so let's go back to your own. Um, so like you got a, a show produced at BAM as well. Is that right? One of your. Well, yeah, it was sort of, it was a rental at the at the Fisher Space. But yeah, we uh, we did a show called Three Way, which is yeah. three one act operas about sex or about right. desire and power and things. Yeah. Right. And uh, how, uh, yeah, that how, was how a, was it? Yeah. How, how was it like um, being reviewed? Like having your work reviewed. Interesting. Uh, uh, oh God, it was frustrating because you're you're like they don't understand. Oh, first of all, for, yeah, like or they're being they're being bitches or they're being flip or they're being glib, right. you know, or whatever. Uh, which is like, yes, I've been that way myself over yeah. the years. So. <laughs> Not so consistently. You, so you live by the sword and you die by the sword. Yeah, yeah, and then you're like, but you know, um, I think I you know I'm not I would. There are many people in the theater or in other fields who have said, who've come to the conclusion that criticism, you know, whether, whether it's good or bad, you know, it doesn't really matter. You just ask yourself, is this useful or not? And I guess useful in the sense, like obviously on the most commercial level, will this get people to see my show? Mm-hmm. Um, the other useful, I guess, like does, is this illuminating in any way to help me with the next project I do, which is like less, less, less ra- uh, more rare, I think. Um, and I, you know, I guess, so the reviews that pissed me off are the ones that put attitude first and didn't really have anything of substance to say about the work. Um, right. but you sure. just, but at the end of the, at the end of the day, you just want them to fucking sell seats. You know, you want them to sell, you know, unless somebody's going to sit down with the work for a long time. And also like you, the, 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 the opera reviews that barely even talked about the music, you're like, did you, you know, if you want to say the, if you think the music was bad, then say that in an articulate way. But, sure. but you know, if you're reviewing opera, you have to at least talk about the music. So, I mean, okay, look, as a theater critic, I'm sure I've been shallow and glib and not gotten it here and there. But, you know, you try to like put some attention to the material. Like you talk about the script, you talk about the story, you talk about the acting. Now, yes, there've been reviews where I can't talk about, where I haven't talked about the, the costumes or the set or the lights, you know, and you didn't want to, you should. You know, and if something about the set or the lighting pops out at you, then write about it. Um, but there's nothing worse than, than than reading a review that just feels like it was just a drive-by. It's like you know, you you glanced at the work. You know, look at the work, write about the work. And yeah, I, I probably didn't uh, I probably didn't uh, rise to that standard with everything I wrote, but I certainly tried. So the reviews that just seemed superficial pissed me off. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but yeah. So I mean. 
I've gone through the same emotions I think that anyone has gone through, which is like, fuck you, you didn't get it. Right. But, but then there have been positive ones, you know, so I've been positively reviewed and negatively reviewed, so. Mm-hmm. Right, and are, are you working on anything right now regarding that, like opera writing or writing? Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing is, um, uh, was, was gonna premiere in June up in Saratoga Springs at a festival, a music festival called the Mostly Modern Festival. Cool. Um, that a composer, uh, it's, a, it's on the campus at Skidmore College, and it's um, basically, it's, a, it's like a 25 minute piece called the Coco Cantata. And it's an answer to a Bach piece called the C- Coffee Cantata from like 1735 or something. And uh, it's a comic piece about, you know, the, the Coffee Cantata is about a father with a daughter who's addicted to coffee, which in 1735 was kind of a, you know, coffee houses and coffee was all the rage. And uh, in, in our piece is a modern sort of answer to that, which is, it's about the world of chocolate. Big, you know, big corporate chocolate versus small boutique chocolate fiers. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's a, yeah, it's like, it's a, it's like a mini opera, basically. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. W- will there be actual chocolate on stage? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, of course can, which, of course, can uh, interfere with the singing a bit, I think, you know, the mucus on the vocal cords and all that. Right. right. That's right. So, awesome. really prop chocolate or something, I guess, you know. The last question I had really was, uh, do you believe like a critic can be like a rock star and have mass appeal? No. Do you think that's impossible? Uh, uh, while keeping his or her integrity? No, because right now in 2020, <clears throat> no. no. I mean, no. I mean, the closest to that is like Simon Cowell. I mean, and he's I not a critic. Say, like, what, what do you think of him? I mean, he's a person who sits there looks smug and gives an opinion, which is not exactly what a critic does. You sure. Know? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, but I guess he's not a critic. He's just a judger. He's just somebody who says, who's a, gives a thumbs up, thumbs down right. sort of response to whatever's in front of him. Um, but you no, know, I mean, like, but as far as like a critic having any sort of clout or like, first of all, in the year 2020, 90% of the people who you talk to and say, say a uh, theater critic, art critic or whatever, their eyes will glaze over and they're not right. going to fuck because- right. so, so, Sorry to interrupt, it, 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 I, 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 agree, I agree with you on that, but why is there still this mentality of like, oh, uh, in the theater world, if the Times give it a bad review, it's done. There's this kind of mentality, which I don't agree with, but like, but like oh, the play is going to be shut down if the Times give it a negative review. So therefore, there is an element that clout some people are. Well, that, but that attitude is like that there's like you were saying Monopoly earlier. I mean, that's the attitude that there is only one paper in town. Right. You know, uh, like when I was at the public one time and having dinner or whatever, and somebody at the next table was talking about shows, and I was like, yes, I'm a, I'm a critic, and da da da. And she was talking about shows that she's, and she said, um, but she said something about, we were comparing shows that we had seen, and she said, uh, yeah, you know, I I, I saw the, the but the critic the critic didn't like that show, so I don't I don't I didn't uh, I don't want to go to that or whatever. And I was like, what What do you mean? Like, the, do you mean the Times critic? There are more than one critic. There's more than one critic out there. Right. So she was a, a very typical audience. Even people who love theater and go to theater a lot, they have this like really narrow minded perspective on. Right. On it. So I, mean, I think there's, a show can survive this if it's like has appealed to the masses regardless of the reviews. Would you agree? Oh, I think so. Yeah, yeah like um, like a show like Wicked, for example, got a exactly. very sort of mixed yeah. to negative review by yeah. the Times. Um, well, the Times only has all this power because we give them power. Indeed. Right. Right. Any critic, you know, it's the same yeah. with any critic. I mean, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of diversity out there among critics and... Yes, yes. But I mean, uh, but, but, the, 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 but the central idea that any sort of critic, like the, the way our culture is organized right now, it's just like, or disorganized or atomized or whatever. It's like, there's no critical authority out there. It's, it's sort of like the wisdom of the crowd, I suppose. It's the, it's the, it's, it's what you, it's the sort of the, the general consensus you come to on, on, on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Yes, right. and, you know, it's like, I keep hearing that this TV series is really good. I should really watch it, you know? Right. Um, right. And whereas, you know, the sixties and seventies and fifties and you know, earlier, you had people like Pauline Kael and um, God help us, John Simon and others who, uh, you know, who actually had like, you know, there were lots and lots of people who actually read reviews or they, you know, they paid attention to what critics said. And, you know, whether right. that was good or bad, I don't know, because, you know, again, you had some really shitty, toxic people do, reviewing these things sometimes, you know, right. 
I'm not, I'm not really giving you a straight answer. Oh, it's like, the thing yeah. is, we don't, we, we just don't live in a culture that's, you know, we live in a, a culture where there's a lot more choices and that's on the, on the face of it, a good thing, I think. So you personally never had a desire to become like a global superstar critic? Sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, that's a great, that's, a, that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, he's like, projecting. Yeah, I'm projecting by. He's uh, just projecting. I'm projecting the, the yeah. 22 year old kind yeah. of like hipster. Uh, hey man, you want to be famous? Yeah. You know, you never. That was never in the, like you were. You had too much integrity for that kind of crap. But the, the, there's no, there was no, there was no pathway to that. I mean, except in some sort of like movie where you make a deal with the devil, and you know that yes. would be sort of it'd be a comedy about. Yeah. No. The, the rock star critic is that's a one line joke. The rock star critic. I mean, that's just like. <laughs> that's Very good. Um, I mean, I think that you can become a. Honestly, you 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 can you can gain a lot more social capital these days as a critic if you're swinging, hmm, if you're swinging big at huge at large cultural targets, like uh, that are that are real and they're out there, like like uh, like racism. Yeah. Like classic classism, you know. If I, if you if you make if you, if, if if you orient your views for social issues, that's that's a way to get capital. Uh, sorry, I'm so glad you brought that up, David, yes. because we almost forgot. Because when I was uh, when we were doing our research, um, yeah. you wrote a piece. Uh, was it about? It was certainly, I believe, dedicated to Trayvon Martin, or was it about? Uh, could you tell us more about mm -hmm. that? I just read somewhere. Sure, that, that was yeah. just a piece that was uh, for baritone and orchestra. I think it was the premiere was in 2017, and it was uh, with a composer named Kiro Okoya, who um, she we we've been working on an opera, uh, <laughs> a very different sort of opera, sort of inspired by a what was it called? Uh, what was that, that Greek legend movie, uh, Clash of the Titans? Yes. It was sort of a an opera that was sort of loosely inspired by that. Um, but then she wanted to do something, you know, dedicated to Trayvon Martin about about the issues of you know obviously like a police shooting of of unarmed black men and women, you know, like this sort of, which uh, I think she approached me in 2016 about it. Anyway, so we just sort of went back and forth and, and came up with a text for it. And she said it, you know, it was, it's, it's kind of like a single voice with orchestra. And, and uh, it's interesting because it's kind of like, it has, it ends with a lot of percussion, like as, like that are, that are representing gunshots. And uh, the orchestra falls out one by one, you know, like sort of like dead bodies uh -huh. by the end of the piece. Yeah, but it's sort of like it's a piece that sort of it's abstract. It's about a, about a the, the voice, the narrator is it's walking home at night and being trailed by somebody who's gonna somebody who's gonna kill him or try to kill him. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right, right. Uh -huh. yeah. So um, the weather is uh, getting warmer and uh, the sun is shining. Um, are you? Yeah. Are you excited to um, do some summer activities over the summer? Do you like to swim uh, or stuff like that? Water ski? Uh, yeah, paragliding? Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, not, is I, that I, a no? I, <laughs> yeah. I, want, I, mean, I mean, I'm from the country and I like, right. to, I like to be out around trees and things. So yeah. I'm looking forward to getting out of the city. Yeah. Nice, mm -hmm. nice. Cool. Uh, sorry, I, 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 I love how we go back and forth and yeah. all, we're, we, we have this brilliant um, bipolar relationship to Dave and Ed Podios, but uh, just to go back briefly to the Trayvon Martin piece, oh, did, yeah, that, sure. did that have a, a long run or did that, it was like a short? That was done in like two places. It was like, you know, like, you know, cl you know these pieces don't necessarily have like eight performances a week. They're like, you know, they, they're, they're on right. concerts that they're done. It was done in Mount Holyoke in 2017. I think it was done in Chicago later that year. So mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. And, yeah. And what was the message of that piece? The message was, well, the title of it is called "Invitation to a Die-In," so it's kind of like uh, "Invitation to a Die-In." Yes. Title, yeah. Yes. Um, the message. Well, the message was this is fucking horrifying, which is going what, the stuff that what's going on, and right, you know, right, right. We're going to sort of demonstrate it to you in a kind of abstract way through the music. Right. Um, in some ways, I think, you know, to bring in opera again, the whole idea of like the music, the, the, the instrumentalists sort of like one by one sort of like dropping out and dying as it were, I mean, yeah. becoming part of the die-in uh, is kind of like inspired partly by the opera, the Dialogues of the Carmelites, which uh, is an opera about some Carmelite nuns who were um, caught in the middle of a, 
of a, a political uh, situation where, where and at the end they were all guillotined. Yeah. I think it's against the, the backdrop of the French Revolution, I believe. Right. And well, guillotine, French Revolution, I think so. Um, and so basically at the end of the opera, off stage you hear the sound of, excuse me, you hear the sound of the guillotine. So, you know, so it's like this dreadful sound of death that's happening off stage one by one as the voices basically, as the voices of the nuns drop out one by one until there's only one left. So it was just sort of somewhat inspired by that, using that to how to theatricalize. I mean, how do you how do you theatricalize or musicalize such a heavy, serious yeah. subject? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's exciting, really. So this is a kind of a deep question. Um, Please. So right now we live in a very uh, divided nation, very divided. We have uh, almost 1984 like divided, and we have two factions in this country who have stopped speaking to each other, really. Um, don't you think that like we need art now more than ever to kind of heal this divide? And uh, it's, it's worrisome that it's been taken away from us during this time. Oh God, I feel so cynical about that to answer that. I mean like- oh, Be cynical. It's okay to be cynical if you want. Sometimes I mean, we're, we're even cynical. Sometimes yeah. even out of Davidson. Yeah. yeah. Were, yeah. Pe were, people okay. were, were people using, I mean, what do you, uh, were people mm -hmm. using art in the first place? To, to heal, I mean, right. they were using, they were using, they were using, you know, entertainment. I mean, God, am I gonna make a distinction between art and entertainment? I mean, that's right. so old fashioned of me. Uh, yeah. But I mean, it's like, I, I don't know. Where's the hope, David? Where's the hope right now? The hope, the yeah. hope is in mass deaths, mass deaths. <laughs> All right, yeah. A, a mass calling of people. Yeah, yeah you know, I always think that was a bit, this bit right. in the Dostoevsky's The Demons, uh, where there's a theorist, uh, there's a group of like radicals who want to change Russia. Yeah. You know, they want, you know this is of course pre uh, pre Bolshevik Revolution. Sure. And one of them said, one of them says, I come up with a formula for how many people uh, around the world have to die in order for, in order for us to to create a perfect society. Right. You know, like eighty percent of the world's population needs to die off, and then we'll reorganize society and have a happy utopia. Wow, so, so, wow, that's very interesting that you said that, because some people are arguing. Some, some people want that. I yeah, some people will argue that there's a certain individual or, or yeah. more than one individual. So, yeah. so yeah. I, could, I could argue that I'm a Malthusian utopianist, okay. meaning that, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah. uh, I, I, art, 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 I mean, yeah, maybe if people are, I mean, the thing is, if, I don't know if people are becoming more dependent on their devices. They're, they are because we are trapped inside using our computers and our phones all the time. Yeah, I'd love yes. to think that when this is when this is over, whatever the fuck that means, that there'll be a mass movement away from or of ta 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 tapering down the use of these things. You know, right. and then and then li then live artistic aesthetic events will become important. Yeah. You know? yeah. Do you worry about the future, like especially with this year being an election year, like? I think we're in for a lot of craziness. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, if he's reelected, I mean, that's just, that's insanity. That's just pure, ins there will be blood. There will be blood. Right. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, what did you think about, Rudy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, the future, God, I, you know, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I hated my fellow Americans for a very long time. You know, I, I grew up in a small, I grew up in a small town. And so having contempt for, for regular folk comes easy to me. Um, so, you know, after, after 2004, when we reelected Bush was already, oh, fuck all y'all. Because it's like, you know, really you want this asshole for another four years, you know, and it was, and it was just, right. So, I mean, I have, you know, in the fact that we elected Trump in the first place, it's just like, there yeah. is a large population in this country that, but I, I guess I'm just adding to the hatred, aren't I? Um, no, no, no. <laughs> just, I mean, I, you know, I know you were kind of half, you were being a bit self-deprecating when you said you're contempt for people, because even though I didn't even see it, I am fascinated by this Trayvon Martin piece from the idea of putting something so topical into an opera, uh, ideally would get an audience of ordinary folk, working class to go in an ideal world. Now, I don't know if that happened with the run you did because of the nature of theater and the audiences that it usually attracts, but you know, like there's something so beautiful about like putting that issue into an opera, I think, you know, and I, it would be great to find an audience for that, that 
Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, operas have been about like, well, I mean, look, first of all, that was just a, that was like a piece. It wasn't really an, an opera. It was, it was kind of like a, okay. it, was like, it was like, it was like a song, extended song in some ways. But, you know, not to make this, but I did do an opera last year at Cincinnati Opera called Blind Injustice, which was about uh, three, sorry, four cases of wrongful conviction uh, that involved six people all together. Right. And um, those were, the, the libretto was based on, on um, interviews, verbatim text, yes. um, about half, half to 40, about 40% of it. That was an opera that was like very much, people were really into that because it was about real issues that people could relate to. Cool. It was about uh, the, the corruption of the legal system. It was about, uh, you know, it was, it was about real issues. So I mean, making opera uh, or making plays or operas or whatever about real, real issues is, a, that's important, of yeah. course. It's a way of, you know, but I mean, but to sort of elevate it over the sort of like the uh, idea of an issue drama or a movie of the week. Sure. That, to sort of transform it through maybe music or through stylized language or a stylized frame into something that's more than just like a, oh, isn't that terrible that this sort of thing happens? I mean, to 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 show our complicity, to show our how how the system feeds a, a certain social problem, to have a to have a, yes. a a wide historical or conceptual lens. That's that's where art can maybe step in. So it's not that some shitty lifetime movie or whatever. Right. What what would you like to see happen to America? Uh, I'd like I'd like to see the government give money to the arts in a very sort of generous, you know, long term way. To to because because you're never going to have people are mm, people are never going to like flock to the arts just of their own volition. The government needs to put money into the arts. The arts needs to like be supercharged with cash so that we can make work and pay people, pay artists, put work out there, and then and then hope that people come. Because right. right now they're fucking sheep that are just wa they're listening to garbage music and watching garbage television and eating garbage and yes. I'm part of that and I'm part of that too I'm part of that too uh, right. and you know how are they going to come to the art you know is that a marketing problem or is it a uh... well I don't think it's a marketing problem I think it's an education problem I think you know yeah. uh, our public education system isn't what it used to be uh, one time in this country. Uh, Greek and Latin were taught in, in high school, you know, and mm -hmm. it's our, our education system isn't good enough. It's garbage in, garbage out. And that's why people will flock to, you know, a Michael Bay movie instead of a Shakespeare play, you know, in my opinion. But, you know, would you agree with that about yeah. the education system? Would you have views on the education system? Yeah, I mean, I guess it all starts with education, doesn't it? I mean, you know. Yes. So yeah, put, putting more money into arts education, getting getting uh, teaching artists into schools. Uh, you know, I mean, those. I mean, the, the arts, um, like the theaters and the art programs of schools, are the first things to get cut. You know, when budgets are being tightened, aren't they? You know? Yes. Brilliant. I mean, I, yeah. Is there any more questions? Uh, any more thoughts, concepts, ideas? Do you, do you would you like to see a radical reconstruction of society? i.e. a revolution. Do you think America is going to break <laughs> you with American revolutions? Blue states versus red states? Oh my God. Uh, we have more guns in this country than we have people. What do you think about that? Bizarre, isn't it's, it? It's, it's going to really be fireworks. <laughs> we think it's all going to kick off, David. That's what we're getting at. Yeah. We're just like... Yep. I mean, obviously, stuff is already kicked off. So I mean, it's not like I'm a fortune teller there. But uh, so you're so you're saying that I should go buy some guns? Is that where <laughs> yeah. look yeah. after yourself? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it feels pretty apocalyptic. It feels pretty apocalyptic, doesn't it? Right. I mean, the the, yeah. the, the, the lack the lack of education, the fear, the uh, the white supremacy, sure. the sure. the uh, <laughs> the the guilt, the historical guilt that uh, that yeah. a poor, yeah. poor yeah. white overarmed a man is feeling in Georgia because he sort of gets up and he washes his hands and he sees blood on his hands and he wonders how he got there and then he he boom and then he goes and he drinks his beer and uh, and he realizes vaguely that perhaps there's blood everywhere in this kitchen and uh, and that's he a great scene yeah yeah well I mean it's just like you know guilt there's a lot of historical guilt I think sure. that's you know like like I did something bad 200 years ago right. and what and I and I don't want to admit it, and uh, right. so, that, so I mean I think that I think that there's a sense that 
Yeah, I, I have a recurring dream that, that I killed somebody, put them in a car, and I sank it at the bottom of a lake. I think it's a very archetypal sort of dream. <laughs> and, that, and in the dream, the car, the car has risen, you know. Yeah. I, I'm aware that the, the, car, the, the car rose. Yeah. And then I'm, 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 about to, I'm about to be arrested. And I think there are a lot of white people in this country who are afraid of getting arrested okay. for crimes against humanity. Wow. <laughs> No, I mean, and so that that so okay. that that puts you in a def that puts you in a defensive posture sure. on every on every level, you know. Yeah, right. And I, you know, and and so yeah, I mean, the, the guns thing is crazy because it's like I kind of want the government to just take everybody's guns away because it'll mean that they'll come out of their houses with guns blazing and they'll get shot. Yes. Right. And that'll deal with that for the moment. And uh, <laughs> no, I don't mean that. But it's like you know, it's like just shoot them, shoot them. <laughs> Wait, one last question. So, because we've we've gone down this route. Well, let's, let's leave it there. Let's leave it there. Shoot them! Kill them! Kill them! Kill them. Yeah. This is this is some high octane stuff. High octane, yeah. Do yeah. you think? Do you think there's a genuine left wing in this country? I'm, I, I, don't, I don't. What do I know? I'm just a sort of you know middle of the road <laughs> schmuck. You know. Uh, no, you're not. You're very intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. You're the, the there's, a le there's a left wing. I mean, I don't know. Jesus, man. I guess what I'm saying is, is, is there any fundamental difference between the Democrats and the Republicans? Yeah. Is it just Coke and Pepsi, really? Is that, <laughs> that's the question in your opinion. They're both, they're both completely corrupted by money, of course, right? Yeah. I think there's an intellectual left, but there's not a, there's, there's an intellectual left, you know, in the academy and elsewhere and in the arts, I guess. But, and maybe even in, in, in certain areas of religion in, in the country. Um, uh, but Did, there's, no, there's, there's, yeah. not a, there's not a there's not a muscle left. Okay. Sure. I mean, there's not a left that, that, Dave. Um, Did the intellectual left have a presidential candidate this year? Interesting. Like who was your? Uh, uh, you know, I want to say Kamala Harris, but you know, because of this work on this on this opera about wrongful conviction, her her record on. On defending prosecutor, her um, record on defending corrupt prosecutorial culture made me really uneasy because she, you know, it's you can be a you can be a um, a district attorney and still be critical of the culture of prosecution, which is like you know conviction at any cost. And I don't think she quite. I mean, she was sort of pushed in that direction to sort of acknowledge that she was that certain cases that were wrong wrongful that the you know you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So I don't. Uh, so beyond Kamala, I was not—I I was never really a Bernie bro. I never was that. <laughs> For what reason? I'm just curious. Uh, we're, we're just because, a political he, Irish boys. We're curious. Yeah. yeah, because he didn't seem to be capable of putting anything to action. It just seemed like rhetoric to me. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's obvious now as well. Yeah. 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 Because he's just disappeared. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Not to be like facetious, but I love being facetious. Did you see the funny meme in April? There was an interesting meme, uh, like a picture of Bernie and a picture of toilet roll, which sold out, which sold out faster this month. Yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Brutal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, if if we were if we were sane and healthy, then we would get behind the country. Would have gone behind Elizabeth Warren, and uh, because you know, right? I think that. <laughs> She, she's, she's got a, she's, well, she's, she's a incredibly accomplished, thoughtful, yeah. I think she's a natural leader. Yeah. Well, you know, but uh, yeah, that's so, that would have, that would have been a, I, that would have been a very positive thing, but it didn't happen. You know, so we have Joe Biden. Right. So. <laughs> what do you think of him? Who has been endorsed by everybody. Yeah, yeah no, good. And, and let him be president and yeah. let him pick a, 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 a genuine vice president who will. Right. Do a lot of do work, work, do the things that he's not doing. Um, Michelle, you know, he's just, yeah. <laughs> Michelle Obama, yeah. uh, president. For vice president, vice, no, flip the ticket and that'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> flip the ticket, nice. <laughs> um, we'd like to have you back sometime, David. Yeah, well, you're such a riveting for a chat on yeah, our podcast. Like, seriously, you know? if you down the road, if, yeah. you, if you'd like to, if you'd like, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I hope uh, I, I had a great time talking and, and thanks for your no, curiosity. Absolutely. And seriously, I think when our people, our huge fan club, listen to this, it might actually change their opinion of critics. Or, yeah. or at least, you know. Yeah. And if you want to, I mean, 
you still have a chance to get famous if you associate yourself with the podcast. Yes, indeed. We're, gonna we're, make you we're going all the way. We're going, all, we're going to Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to make Hollywood great again like it was in the 30s and yes, 40s. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all those great communist writers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think there's a TV show about that. Uh, now, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. I haven't watched that yet. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Let's check it out. Okay, seriously, um, thank you so much. for. Thank you. Time. Yeah, yes. have a great day. We look forward to reading more of your reviews. Okay. Oh, thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, David. Thank Thanks, you very David. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Good luck. And that was David Cody. Wow, that was a great conversation. We really we, enjoyed that. We really Feel yeah. alive after that. We cover every topic imaginable. Exactly. And we'll see you next time. Next time we have the Irish storyteller Eddie Lenehan. Eddie Lenehan, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk about fairies. Not the kind of fairies you think. All right. Peace out, you guys. And end.